and I am now going to turn it over to Penn Faulkner's Executive Director, Gwydion Sullivan. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Politics and Prose. As you may all know, Penn Faulkner is a national literary organization, but we are very proud to have our roots here in Washington, D.C. And we're especially delighted to have Politics and Prose as one of our long-term allies. Thank you for, for letting us be here and partner with you on this tonight. I hope it's the first of many. Our mission is very simple, to champion the breadth and power of fiction in America. And I can hardly think of a better way to do that than to introduce Matthew Salasis, who is one, the author of one of our 2021 Penn Faulkner Award finalists, Disappear, Doppelganger, Disappear, uh, as well as the national bestseller, Craft in the Real World. Uh, and of course, his newest novel, the one we're all here to hear about tonight, The Sense of Wonder, which Ron Charles in the Washington Post uh, called A Remarkable Feat of Artistic Prowess. Now, Matthew, one of BuzzFeed's 32 essential Asian American writers, also writes about adoption and race and Asian American masculinity. And you can read his work all over in The Best American Essays, NPR's Code Switch, The New York Times blog, Motherload, uh, The Guardian. For my money, he writes with artful daring do, with intellectual precision, and especially for me, a very rare level of bravery and candor that I admire a great deal. So I hope you will all join me in welcoming Matthew Salasis. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Just take off this awkwardness. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Politics and Prose. Uh, Susan Gridian, thank you so much, the Penn Faulkner Foundation. Uh, so I started this novel two years after Lynn Sanity, um, which I'll just, you know, for those of you who remember, that's great. Some of you probably, now if I say that to my students, they have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> which is sad, because um, it was the best I've ever felt about America, <laughs> which is true, but also a joke, I guess. Um, but it was, so Jeremy Lin, who was probably known to nobody except for Asian American basketball fans, I knew of him, um, and had been following his career since he was at Harvard as a college player, um, came off the end of the Knicks bench. There was, he was like the fourth point guard on an NBA team, which you don't need for point guards. Uh, and just by kind of luck and happenstance, was able to get uh, a chance since nobody was really giving him one. Uh, and he ended up leading this terrible Knicks team, you know, basically pretty much by himself to six wins in a row in his first six starts in pretty you know, amazing fashion. He was named NBA Player of the Month for that month, and um, you know, he was really the best player in the NBA for two weeks. Uh, it was kind of just an amazing moment, and then, and then of course, like the Knicks had to lose some time, right? And there was the racist headline ESPN, all of the stuff people had been holding back, just kind of waiting for him to lose, all came pouring out, right? Um, so maybe like a year or so after this, I started thinking about what a story would look like, what a novel would look like, told from this perspective. Uh, and then I started writing that book actually in a class um, where we had prompts to write the beginning, middle, and end of a novel. So I had the beginning, middle, and end of a novel, which is, I don't know, 70 something pages. And then I put it aside for a long time and didn't want to write the parts in between. Um, and then maybe another couple of years after that, I just, I had all this time because my wife had cancer and there was a lot of time where she was just kind of sleeping and I was there with her. Um, and so I looked back at the novel and I thought, now I'll write the other parts of the novel. 
Um, but instead of doing that, I just read a whole new beginning, middle, end of a novel uh, from another perspective, in the perspective of a woman who produces K-dramas. At that time, K-drama wasn't really a super big thing here. Um, and I've, I've kind of enjoyed watching it become a bigger thing. Uh, and hopefully it will still grow into an even bigger thing. But I was really writing about the same feeling that I had uh, during Linsanity, which was this feeling that more than we thought was possible was possible. Or this feeling of like anything could actually happen and maybe we need it to happen. Uh, and I needed it to happen. I mean, my wife needed it to happen. Um, and we at least needed to kind of believe in that. Um, so I was always writing about wonder, sense of wonder. But also the uh, narrator's name is, is Juan, which I thought at first would be funny to have a basketball player named Juan, right? Like you won the game. <laughs> and then from there, I tried to figure out how could I turn this into a pun like Linsanity. Uh, but so I'm going to read chapter two, which is the first chapter is actually just a dirty joke. And <laughs> my kids who are here, I t my daughter is 11. I told her she couldn't read the book because it starts with a dirty joke, which, of course, was a mistake. I know. <laughs> so now she's read it. It's too late. This chapter is called High School Romance. I got to know Robert Sung pretty well in the end, and the key to him was what he was like in high school. In high school, he was the second best baller on a team that won three straight New York State championships, and he got none of the credit. That lack of credit became the defining story of his life. In other words, in the story of his own life, he was a subplot. When we met, Sung was ESPN's beat writer for the New York Knicks. I just signed with the Knicks after two years on the Clippers bench, after two years all Ivy in college, and won as conference MVP. Sung had grown up wanting to be the first Asian American basketball star. I was the only Asian American in the league. In other words, <laughs> people often compared us. We were the same height, 6'2", both point guards, and most importantly for this story, both played with the same superstar, Powerball, exclamation point. Captain of the Knicks and perennial favorite for MVP, though he never won. Actually, in that amazing Ron Charles review, which was, was it's so, such a pleasure to be read well, um, the one thing that he <laughs> got wrong is Powerball actually changes his name to Powerball legally so that anytime somebody has to write his name, he has to, they have to write an exclamation point, which was I just thought was funny. I had grown up watching Powerball, copying his moves. Sung had grown up playing in PB's shadow. I was five years younger, but since Powerball had gone pro after one year of college, he was in his 11th year in the NBA, and I was in my third. Sung had been covering the Knicks for four years. They had a strange relationship. Powerball had everything Sung ever wanted in life, both professionally and personally. Even the woman Sung loved, Britt Young, who had been with Powerball since high school. Despite that rivalry, Sung was Powerball's biggest advocate, his press cheerleader. He argued endlessly that Powerball's reputation as a great individual player who could never lead his team to a championship was unfair. Powerball, in fact, had won championships in high school and college. Sung blamed the Knicks' playoff woes on the owner's bad decisions. To me, Sung's obsession seemed unhealthy. On the other hand, obsession paid his bills. Journalists are truly terrifying people. He wrote about Powerball because he got money to write about Powerball. But also, if you envy someone, it's only natural to want everyone to think they're the best. How embarrassing to envy someone just OK. Sung knew Powerball's winning instinct firsthand. On their shared high school team, Sung had done the dirty work. He had taken what the offense had given him and still managed 18 and 5. He had what TV announcers call hustle, which is what they say when a player does more on the court than in their own limited imaginations. In high school, Sung had seemed destined for a Division I scholarship, four years of points in girls, and being the hottest Asian on campus if not a shot at the league. Then 
halfway through his senior season, he blew out his knee. He kept the ball in a crucial play and came down from the winning layup on someone's foot. Power balls. The knee required surgery and Sung missed the rest of the season. Yet that didn't stop the team from winning a third straight state championship. Scouts rated Powerball the top high school player in the nation and Sung's scholarship prospects dried up. He landed in Division II where he was overplayed and re-injured his leg, ending his career. I met Sung before my season in New York even started. The Knicks had invited me to play on their summer league team as a kind of tryout. And afterward, they signed me to a one-year, non-guaranteed contract. I crashed with a teammate while I looked for an apartment, but I wasn't sure I would last in New York. The only articles about the signing implied that my role on the team was to sell jerseys to New York Asians. I represented a new market. All I could do was focused on the one thing I controlled, training. So when Sung called me, I was at the practice facility with one of the team's shot coaches. I didn't know how Sung got my number, but I said I would text him when I was done. And after my shower, I texted that I could meet wherever he wanted. Immediately, someone knocked at the door. I jumped. I mean, it was weird timing. I didn't actually think it was him. The practice facility is an hour from Manhattan. I pulled on my sweats and opened the door. A tall Asian guy tried to peek past me. Can I help you? I asked. It's me, he said. I had never seen him before. Robert Sung, he reached out his hand. I just texted you. My spine fucking tingled. When I recovered, I had a good look at him. He was still in basketball shape, as tall as me, but stockier, maybe 220, freakishly broad-shouldered. He was good looking. They sometimes put him on TV with these tender, droopy eyes, single-lidded, a high nose bridge, and dense hair cut just above his eyebrows. Real puppy dog look, but it worked for him. He bounced on his toes, hyped, eager, and despite my wariness, this moved me. No reporter had been so excited to see me since college, maybe not even then. He craned his neck and peered into the locker room, and that was when he confided in me his dream to be the first Asian American basketball star when he saw that we were alone. I could tell he was trying to convince me that he was on my side. I wasn't immune to the connection. It was lonely, being the only Asian American in the league and hardly ever getting off the bench. Maybe for the first time, I recognized just how lonely I was and just how much it might help to talk to someone else who understood what that was like. Sometimes you don't know how alone you are until you realize you don't have to be alone. But the connecting part was over. Sung peered past me again and said, I heard Powerball would be back today. Is he in there? I really need to see him. I said he wasn't there. I hadn't seen him. My voice shriveled. We were high school teammates, you know, Sung said. I was literally in your position. He would really want to see me? I mean, if he's in there and just pretending not to be? What was even creepier than a stranger driving an hour to see me? A stranger driving an hour to pretend to see me. I should have known then that Powerball would always be Sung's main subject, that Sung would consider anyone else the same as himself, a subplot. Thank you. So happy to take uh, any questions, you know, about sports, kid drama, life, writing. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. This is my. What was your personal history in basketball? Did you play? I played basketball all through high school, and then played pickup in college. I grew up in Storrs, Connecticut, where the UConn, where UConn is, but also really the UConn team it plays. Um, and then I went to college at UNC Chapel Hill, so it was big <laughs> basketball all the time. Played a lot of basketball. 
but um, you know, obviously couldn't make the NBA. <laughs> Uh, b- basketball on the curriculum down at, at UNC for sure. Yeah. Uh, my ne- my nephew Josh is a, is a, a Korean adoptee, a Capitol policeman, and just had a tryout with the New York Yankees. But my question is, uh, if Rui Hashimura was just traded by the with the Wizards, it sounds like the Wizards were disappointed with the appeal that he had to Asians in this area. Do you have any take on that or any thoughts? Yeah, it's it's weird, right? When it becomes like your body is the thing that they're selling, which of course it always is, but um, usually it's for basketball, right? Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I think Lynn kind of ran up against the same problems. And in the end, Dolan was like, well, we've already made millions and millions off of dollars off of you. And it's probably we're going to make a depreciating amount of money and we're going to have to pay you more and more money. So it's like not a good investment. Um, unless we're thinking about winning basketball games or something. <laughs> and now they're, now they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yes, now they're good. It only took 11 years. <laughs> for someone who worked for Jim Dolan for a while, I'm wondering <laughs> if he's going to read your book. <laughs> um, I did read this book really closely, and I'm one, which is your craft in the real world. I'm wondering how much of your own revision strategies did you work into your novel at different stages? It was very intriguing that you started and stopped. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I actually... Most of the things in Craft in the Real World came from revising this novel and revising Disappear, Doppelganger, Disappear, um, and then just teaching the classes. So all those revision exercises in the book, uh, the end of the book, um, are actual exercises that I've given my classes before, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, cleaned up a little bit to try to make me look smarter. But (laughs) (laughs) um, so I was kind of, I've been kind of doing those things, you know, the entire time, but I can't kind of, I don't know if I could pinpoint exactly a lot of the, some of the things that are in those exercises I do pretty much every draft, which is like make a list of decisions and actions that the characters make. I'm often doing that, trying to trace, you know, how their decisions change throughout the course of a book. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like how that tracks with the internal arc that I'm thinking about. Um, a lot of the revision for this book was actually more about trying to fit these two halves that were related to me but maybe we're not totally related on the page yet together to make one book. And, you know, originally I had right three parts for each of them. I think it's a seven part book now where it's like three parts from one, two from Carrie, and then two where Carrie's talking about the K-drama that she makes. Okay. It's really interesting. I can't <laughs> wait to read it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Matthew. Hi. I really appreciate your book. Thank um, you so much. And as a Korean American myself, I wanted to hear more about how you, um, how you spoke into the different narratives of being Korean American, um, also as an adoptee, and what went into crafting the characters and so the sort of perspectives that you wanted to refract in your novel. Yeah. Thanks for that question. So, um, I, you know, so I was, I'm adopted and I grew up in Connecticut uh, and like, a, I was just saying, in a very like white rural town. Um, the University of Connecticut was originally an agricultural school and so it's surrounded by fields of like cow pastures and stuff. Um, like the next town and over for me um, had more goats than people. <laughs> Though I grew up thinking like this was the suburbs, I don't know why. <laughs> Um, so I had that kind of perspective and I had been writing mostly Korean adoptee protagonists in other books and and in my stories too, but I wanted to like kind of switch what originally, you know, was the idea of like a kind of observer narrator with a, like a larger than life, uh, secondary figure like Gatsby or, you know, many other books, um, and I thought it'd be fun to actually have the larger than life person look at the right, look at the person who's observing. 
Uh, so in this case, a reporter. Uh, and I knew I wanted the the protagonist um, to be somebody with a kind of similar story to Lynn's. Uh, so I didn't want adoption to be a part of that story, but I did, oh, and I do always want adoption to be kind of a part of the stories that I'm writing. Um, you know, just thinking always about like how few stories we have that are also written by adoptees. So um, that was one part of it. And I, I thought a lot about like moments where I felt both like really buoyed by the community, Asian American community and Korean American communities, but also times where I've felt like I don't really belong to those communities or have been made to feel maybe that I don't really belong to those communities um, because of not having shared cultural uh, touchstones, right? And, and so that was part of it. And I think of one's, you know, version of, of Robert's song as not really very authoritative, but it's definitely something that he thinks is going on. And he's always has like adoption on his brain. And he, for like, if there's a person who's not adopted, he's always kind of reading adoption into Robert Sung's actions. Um, but I didn't want that to be the only kind of adoptee narrative in the story either. So there are a couple other adoptees who have different tracks or different like ways of living their lives and ways of thinking about adoption in it. Um, and then there are, you know, of course, like the other kind of Korean Americans in the book. I wanted it to be, right, like a kind of book filled with Korean Americans. I guess I always kind of, <laughs> these days, always want them to be full of Korean Americans. Um, but I, maybe it's just because I'm trying <laughs> on some level to, to write what, exactly what Carrie wants, which is like a Korean American K-drama. So thinking, I, I assume some level you have had or have currently a passion for basketball. Um, how <laughs> addressing a subject literarily requires some pushing into maybe its flaws and its downsides. I wonder how, is that something that happened naturally for you as you wrote this project or do you sort of have to force yourself to face maybe some of the uglier sides of something that you have a passion for and that you like? Yeah, maybe it's like a character flaw, but I, I don't seem to have that problem usually. <laughs> I think I'm seeing all too clear, like the flaws, and then I am like trying to battle that part of it with the part of it that's like I like this game and I like playing it and I like watching it and I like following it. Um, I actually don't follow basketball as much now, though it's really the only sport I still follow. But the kind of, you know, like the the ways in which it kind of reproduces. Th nationwide hierarchies and power structures I thought a lot about and I think a lot about all the time and maybe like you know it's happening in, in many of our sports you know like football obviously um, but in basketball there's a there's an interesting way in which the players you know are aware of the ways in which they do have some power um, and like kind of a, just as a recent trend I don't think this was really as much of a part of the game maybe even like 15 years ago um, but now the way that the game goes and the way that the players kind of can have some control over their movements I think is really interesting but I still kind of end up you know following the offseason narratives almost more than the season itself and then just like watching the playoffs Um, thank you, Matthew. Um, as someone born and raised uh, in Indiana, I'm familiar with A, basketball, and B, cow pastures. So I just wanted to... <laughs> um, um, but I want to know, um, who were the writers that you that made you want to be a writer? Was there a novelist or a prose writer who had these, you know, made this sort of formidable, or, or, uh, this impression on you that made you want to, I have to do that? So Yeah, yeah. There were, uh, you know, actually when I was in sixth grade... I wrote a uh, like a fan fiction novel of the Redwall series. I don't know if people remember this. It's like mice for some reason who have like medieval weaponry and live in like you know I always thought of them as like human sized human sized animals because they live in a castle. But I guess it would have been like a just a really small castle <laughs> in the woods somewhere. Um, 
So I, I, you know, I kind of grew up with stories. My parents were both school librarians and like the one thing they're, you know, they would never talk about money and they would hardly ever get us anything. And, um, but they would always get us books. So like books were the one thing we could have and books were the kind of thing that was most like, uh, encouraged around the household. So I was always reading things. Um, even though, you know, I don't know if I found anything that really spoke to me until maybe like college, possibly. Like I took my first Asian American lit course in college and it was, it was kind of a revelation that even existed, you know? <laughs> yeah. I remember a writer from DC, a friend of mine, Amber Sparks, told me once that before she went to, or before she went to college, she thought that all of the writers were dead that there were no more writers alive. <laughs> and it was a real like surprise to her to find out that people who were still writing were alive. <laughs> Couldn't seem that way sometimes. Um, can I go twice? Oh, I didn't see you guys. Um, <coughs> so the, the, I have trouble talking, but so I, my wife and, and I um, adopted a a daughter from Vietnam when she was like four months old. Now she's 20, and we're estranged. And I'm trying to find the, how to get her back, you know? And apparently you write about adoption. Which of your books might help me on that, maybe? And is it kind of, my, I say, you're supposed to honor your father, and I wonder if she's going, but you're not my father, you know? Any thoughts about that at all? Help me. Yeah, that's tough. Um, I mean, I think this happens quite a bit more than we usually are willing to look at. Um, I don't know if you like, they, it's hard because you can't go in, back into the past, right? Um, you've got to try to like build a future together and maybe, but maybe it's a, more of like a future that your child wants. Did you write them some, when they first about adoption? Yeah, there's always adoption, always adoption going on in this thing. Okay. <laughs> oh, sure. I guess I could. Let's read the next chapter. So it's it's the MeQ between the two narrators. So this chapter is called "Love at First Slight." I like puns. <laughs> After that first meeting, Sung kept inviting me out. Maybe he felt bad that we had started on the wrong foot. I made up excuses not to join him, but eventually we ran into each other. An old college friend had starred in an Asian American film, and one of our mutuals had tickets to the premiere. I had already committed to going when Sung texted. For whatever reason, Maybe I didn't want to share anything Asian with him. I told him I wasn't interested in a movie just because it was Korean. I wanted him to catch my drift. The venue was an old art center in Midtown with a theater room that could seat maybe 150 and a larger ballroom for the reception. I convinced my friend to sit in the back row. The film was a rare look at small town Asian America and still it managed to be cliched. Our actor friend played a son who moves back in with his Korean mom after his white dad dies. To help overcome their grief, he convinces his mom to start a restaurant together. But lo and behold, the neighbors they have known for years want nothing to do with them now. The son has to go door to door, smiling, reminding them of old relationships. When the restaurant finally starts doing okay, a white guy in a ski mask breaks in and then in the middle of robbing the place, kills the mom. I was disappointed, but the audience gave the film a standing ovation. We were an Asian American crowd starved for representation. At the reception, the mutual friend and I caught up with the actor, David Yu. As the three of us chatted about the good old days, Sung appeared. I felt bad for lying to him, but we didn't know each other. On the other hand, once the season got underway, he would cover every Knicks game for the largest sports website in the world. I had to be smart. I pretended to be glad to see him. 
I said, I decided to go to the premiere after all. I introduced him to my friends. This is the kind of person Sung was. He asked David Yu why the guy had chosen to do such a shitty movie. I've been thinking the same thing. I nearly choked on my drink. Excuse me, David said. His face got red, or redder since he had the Asian flush. <laughs> you know this fucker, Juan? He writes for ESPN, I said, hoping that would buy me enough time to get Sung away from him. You've got too much talent to waste it on that kind of movie, Sung said. I pulled his arm. He yanked it back and his hand knocked into someone's drink. A woman gave a small gasp. David swore and jumped back, his eyes flashed. I remembered suddenly why we hadn't liked him much in college. He had yelled at one of the women in our friend group over a C-plus project, despite saying nothing to the other members, all male. After that, he had orbited the group awkwardly. I wondered how I could forget that, what that forgetting said about me. A little of the woman's champagne had spilled on David's suit. It wasn't a big deal. He just wanted someone to dump on. Sung said something to me, but I was no longer paying attention. I was holding David back. He pointed at the woman and said, she better not be a reporter too, because he was about to, what he was about to do to her was off the record. <laughs> Before we could find out what he meant, she threw the rest of her champagne at his face. <laughs> Without thinking, I jumped in front of the drink as if to take the charge. It turned out to be the best possible thing I could have done. With my face wet, Sung was apologetic. David Yu shut up. The woman pulled me out of the reception and helped me dry off. As she dabbed a, a napkin on my forehead, I stared at her cat-like eyes, her sharp chin, the deep groove in her philtrum. The truth was, she had made a strong impression on me from the start, even before her drink hit me. For one, she was tall, maybe six feet. I like tall women. Most ballers do. Then there was the sleeveless navy jumpsuit she wore that showed off how buff her arms were. I liked strong women, too. She had the presence of someone confident, and she spoke in short, direct clips, not mincing words. If you stare at me like that, she said, I might think you're hot for me. Who are you, and why did you do that? We introduced ourselves. Wan Lee, Carrie Kong. She was a producer for some big studio looking for some more Asian American talent. When I asked how she got into the business of representation, she told me a memory from an early trip to Korea, channel surfing at our homeowner's house and seeing Koreans on every station. The first time she could recognize this reality as possible. Before that trip, she had thought Korean TV was something on bootleg DVDs and at Korean restaurants. We all have a story like this, an origin story about the first time the world showed us our own reflection. That film sucked, she said. And still, I was going to tell that asshole he did a good job. I was going to get his number. You saved me. She added, get his number for a future project, not a date. Not a date, I asked. No, she said. You're single, I asked. Don't make this so awkward, she said. She laughed deeply like she had a lower register hidden somewhere inside her. And it was that, but it was also her smile. Her eyes curved into small arches, small rainbows, and both cheeks dimpled. I wanted to see those dimples again and again. Later, Sung would claim that he was the reason Carrie and I got together. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, Susan, you want me to sign? Oh, okay. Thank you so much. It's been really a delight listening to you tonight. I have a question around culture and identity, and I think you just touched on this in this last great reading where you said um, we all have a moment where the world shows us our reflection. And I wonder if you might share with us if you had that kind of moment on your own and what insights you've had about your own identity and culture 
through your writing, because clearly you've done a lot of research and you bring elements of Korean drama and all these other yeah. cultural touchstones that you've had. And if you can just share some of your own processes, not just process, but your own insights. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So I remember as a kid having this moment where I looked in the mirror and actually kind of saw myself for the first time. And I had been thinking of myself, you know, because my parents would tell me this all the time, like, you're just like, you're just like us, right? You get this from us. Like, my parents still say this to me, like, oh, you bite your fingernails because your dad bites your fingernails. And it, and I stop sometimes now and think, wait, but that actually makes no sense at all, <laughs> right? Um, and so I remember looking in the mirror and thinking, what the Oh, that's that's me, right? Like I actually don't look at anything like my parents, um, and I had to kind of keep reminding myself of that throughout my childhood. Um, and I, it wasn't really a good reminder, but it wasn't also like a as terrible maybe as it as it seemed like when other people were telling me that I should be reminding myself of this. Um, but I remember watching like a like. Korean TV and Korean movies for the first time in Korea. Um, we were, I went back when I was 24 for the first time, knowing nothing about Korea because it was like 2005 maybe, and there was no Korean things in Connecticut at least. Um, and there was it was like that was the year before Samsung and LG came to America. Because I remember when I came back from Korea the next year, like there were LG chocolate phone ads all over the place. And it was like LG was suddenly a thing. Like in the time that I had left and come back, LG was like a, a company in America. Um, and just kind of watching the shows and seeing, right, like just seeing all these Korean faces, but then also seeing like how different the stories were. Like one of the first movies I watched in Korea was The King and the Clown. And it's this movie where about the like the equivalent of kind of court gestures or traveling gestures. And the first half of the movie is these like clowns like clowning around, right? Just like traveling from town to town, doing funny things, having funny talks with each other. Um, and then they get to the palace and the king it falls in love with one of them and everybody dies <laughs> just right it, it goes from like a complete comedy to a complete tragedy and it's like a, like a, just a 180 um and at the, at the time i saw it the first time i thought i saw it i thought like wow look at this experimental movie you know um and then after seeing more korean films i thought oh this is just like a thing that happens <laughs> right like this is a, th a possibility for storytelling that i just had thought would be only possible as an experiment, but it's actually like a built-in thing that can happen. Um, and so seeing those kinds of ways in which a story kind of could mirror, you know, the ways I felt about my own life, those were real moments for me. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, this has been a really interesting so far, so thank you for doing this. Um, I, my mom is a Korean adoptee and as well, so uh, this has been really interesting to hear. And I'm also doing a project for, uh, I'm a junior in high school, so I'm doing a project that I'm submitting to College Board. Uh, it's a research project on transcultural adoption. And I was, this has just been really helpful so far. Um, so I was just wondering um, if you could talk about what, changes or solutions or resources you would like to see uh, for transcultural adoptees or Korean adoptees in the U.S. And obviously you've talked a lot about representation so far and that's been really helpful, but I was wondering if there were other things that you haven't touched on yet that you would like to talk more about. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's like, like a, there's a lot of good research out there. Um, my friend Jaron Kim is one of the top researchers on Korean adoption in the country. And um, I think when I'm reading a lot of the research by Korean adoptees, what often comes up is like, you know, if you think about all of the money that goes into adoption here, right, and all the money that people pay for adoption, and all of the money that the industry brings in, you know, both on the state side and on the Korean side, right, 200, 
over 200,000 Korean adoptees exist in the world from like basically mostly 1970 to 1990 was the major wave. And that's probably like 160,000 people. And the government made a ton of money on that. It's like how BTS now is like half of the <laughs> Korean GDP. Adoption was a huge part of the Korean GDP. Um, and so like it was a it was a difficult time too in Korea and um, the country it was kind of gathering what resources it could and now feels, I think, pretty bad about it. But if you think of all of the resources that went into the other side of adoption and you took all of those resources and put them into families that felt the need to give their kids up for adoption, I think, you know, the whole thing would look so different. Right. So that's the kind of main push that it seems like uh, adoptee researchers are, are, are kind of hoping for, um, though, you know, like you always think, who does money serve? Right. And that's the problem with trying to do it. OK, thank you. <laughs> sure. Good luck on your project. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was great. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, everyone.